so Alex, when you're feeling overwhelmed with the day-to-day stuff, like, you know, literally this morning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what? You also had a crazy morning? <laughs> beyond. Beyond. But h- how do you, like, how do, how do you know, like, you know, like that you are feeling overwhelmed? Okay. It's a total physical thing. It's not in my head. My body tells me. Mm. Um, I think <laughs> like when I feel overwhelmed, I mainly feel overwhelmed when I'm just juggling too many balls. And so when I'm doing too much juggling, I will get this sensation that like there is not enough oxygen in my lungs to breathe. Yeah. (laughs) What about you? I could see that. I mean, like I I don't have that. I think it's very normal. I mean, I'm not like a therapist or anything, so I don't know. But like I I validate this. I just, I just feel very frazzled. Just frazzled. like, yeah. Just like, I feel like my head is spinning. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ripke Silver. And I'm Alex Fletcher. And this is Deep Meaningful Conversations, powered by Meaningful Minute. The podcast where we explore the complexities, nuances, and joys of being a from woman. Welcome back to DMC. We are so happy that you've joined us again. And today we are talking about overwhelm. It's juggling all of our responsibilities as from women, um, keeping all those balls in the air, trying not to drop any. Although I did hear a wonderful analogy that if you drop any, make sure those are the rubber balls that are dropping, not the glass balls. I just included that in a speech I gave recently, actually. Yeah. Awesome advice. (laughs) It's a great visual. And just really hoping today that this episode is going to deliver on both the deep and the meaningful. Yes. (laughs) Okay, this is a topic that we've gotten a lot of requests to discuss on the podcast, something that definitely hits a nerve in the community. Um, Women who are feeling that they juggle so much, they're feeling overwhelmed by their responsibilities, and they're trying to tackle their ever-growing, I would say, endless to-do list. And we're all trying to do everything the best that we can, (laughs) Right. (laughs) right? But sometimes we feel like we're falling short, and we're not doing anything well enough. Anything. You know, because we're doing so much of everything. Yeah. So, and can I just say that it's like, I mean, who relates to this? It's Erev Pesach, right? Yeah. Enough said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is like the perfect episode for right this now. time. <laughs> or any time if you're listening yeah, to Pesach. Yeah, any time. <laughs> but um, just wanted to make a little disclaimer, as we often do on DMC. <laughs> we are not trying to start up another mommy wars here sure not and i'm sh- if you're not familiar we're talking about that battle of like which superior stay-at-home mom work full-time mom work part-time mom like that's really not what we're talking about um just want to acknowledge that these feelings of stress overwhelm and sometimes honestly like inadequacy like we're just not feeling adequate we're not doing er- anything anything right of all the millions <laughs> of things that we are doing um this can apply to any from what any from woman, whether you are single, whether you have seven children, you know, it doesn't matter. It's something for that all women, we have a lot on our plates. Right. And sometimes we think like, oh, if only we had it like our friend who doesn't work as many hours as I do or whatever it is. And it's just, it's, it doesn't benefit any of us when we start thinking that. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. So um, just to share a, a funny story. So, you know, my husband was a resident and... Um, was working full time, you know, during those years, I went working part time, full time, just each year was different, depending on whatever my teaching schedule was, and what I wanted to do, however many kids I had, whatever, all those different factors. And when he finished residency, I was like, finally, I don't have to work anymore. And just disclaimer, I the year after that, where I didn't work, I actually did go back to work because I was like, oh, full tuition. (laughs) So yeah, that was like a little dream of mine. It was not realistic. Anyway, um, but I remember going, speaking to my principal, telling her like glowing that my husband's finished residency and now I can be a stay-at-home mother and I'm not coming back to teaching. And she was genuinely like shocked that I wasn't coming back. Like, I thought you were going to be with us for decades. And I'm like, no, this was always the plan. You know, residency's over. I'm done and I was so naive and I'm, I so remember and I'm so embarrassed when I think about it I was like I'm so excited I'm gonna be like making more dinners like nicer dinners and I had this like I shared with her like I'm just so excited to like get those recipes like hit those recipes and family first I'm finally gonna make them for dinner and she looked at me like what was I thinking and was like Alex you're still not gonna make those dinners <laughs> And oh my gosh, is she was right? She right? Yeah. Ah. Like you just find other stuff to do and not to like minimize anybody's responsibilities, whether you're working hard or you're just, you know, outside of the home or inside of the home or you're just home alone, you know, by yourself with children. It's just, there's just always so much to do. Yeah. And I never ended up fulfilling that dream of making those 
dinners fancy dinners <laughs> i mean we make dinner but not like how yes, i want yes, it to definitely be. there's dinner we don't want to misrepresent so but, yeah. but yeah no i hear i you know it's interesting that's i'm so glad that you said that because i think there is that perception of like oh if my schedule was different then i would be able right. to do all these things you're not the first person to say something i've heard that actually recently from someone else and i think that that whole just like balancing the work and the responsibilities and this that and the other um so i primarily do freelance work is like what i do and i and so it's like it comes and it goes and it's this and it's that. And I, I think that you actually said this to me once, Alex, about how I was like, oh, I'm a stay-at-home mom. And you're like, Rivki, you, you're a work-from-home mom. And I was like, <laughs> that is actually true <laughs> because I do actually work quite a lot. But the thing about freelancing is that it's like it's not – there's no kvias. It's kind of like all over the place, which means I can never get into a like rhythm with it or develop systems. So it's like – you know, how functional is the house this week? Well, I have, you know, I accidentally double booked two different performances. So I have multiple rehearsals. So dinner is whatever's in the freezer right. and laundry is don't ask. Right. You know, and I think that one of the things that was most helpful to me in not beating myself up when I was not functioning at the at the level at which I would prefer, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. you know, um, was just to remind myself like Gamza Yavor, right? This is going to pass too. Mm -hmm. Like it's okay. Like it's okay that it's not functioning the way I want it to right now. Well, you know, in a week, my schedule will be different and I'll see what I can do then. It's a great tip. You know, it was the only way. Otherwise, it, I just really was feeling so bad all the time. I was like, you know, I wasn't being the mommy or the wife or the human I wanted to be. Right. But like at the same time, I didn't want to, whatever. I still wanted to work. Right. The and also, it's just important to acknowledge there are just stages and we may be functioning more optimally at different times, whether it's a different day of the week or a different week or a different or, year. Or a different just, stage like, of life. Yeah. Give ourselves some grace that like we're going to get through this. Exactly. Okay. So today, who are we having on? Rachel Herkman. So excited about this interview. So excited. So funny. <laughs> I will just, when we interviewed her, she was like totally fangirling here. I'm like, what? But we're fangirling <laughs> you. <laughs> so um, Rachel is a licensed clinical social worker in Manhattan. Um, and she's here with us on DMC to talk about the mental health aspect of overwhelm. So Rachel is interesting. She's really passionate about opening up conversations around real life topics, um, specifically utilizing social media to promote, men to promote mental health awareness mm -hmm. and to help people feel less alone in their common struggles. So that's so our vibes, Rifki, right? A hundred percent. And um, we're really we're really just curious to hear her assessment of what from women are going through when it comes to their struggles and feeling overwhelmed and juggling all those balls. A hundred percent. Okay, so with that, we bring you our DMC with Rachel Herkman. We hope you enjoy. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for coming and joining us on Deep Meaningful Conversations. We're super excited. And let's just jump right in. In your experience working in the from community, what does like the overwhelmed from woman look like? What are her struggles? Okay. So before I even start elaborating on that, I want to first say that I recognize that in us discussing the overwhelmed from women, we're often talking about a woman who's married with children. And I just want to make space for the fact that there are many people in our community who are davening, who are praying to have this problem. And they are waiting to have this problem. They're waiting to be in a position where they are so overwhelmed with a house full of children or people to take care of. They're waiting to find a partner or they're waiting to have children or whatever it might be. And so I just want to put that out there in terms of that. I recognize that for today, we might be focusing some content on a specific type of overwhelmed from women, but also recognizing that there are people who would like to be more overwhelmed in that way. And that it's also okay to feel grateful even when you're feeling overwhelmed. In other words, that this idea of, oh, I should just be grateful because I have this, we can also make room for that alongside the fact that we're feeling overwhelmed. So I just wanna put that out there as a disclaimer that all those who are listening, who are waiting for that sense of overwhelm, I, I, I hope, I hope, and I'm thinking of you. So in terms of your question of what does that look like? So I think that the overwhelmed from women does not have only one look. And for many people, that's part of the stress is looking like you have it all together, but deep down feeling very much like you're falling apart, right? So even right now I look put together, but 45 minutes ago, I was, I'm shoveling in my, my yogurt and I'm going over this and the kids that, right? So, right. But I don't, I don't look right now. Like I might've been over. And I don't know if I was even over one, but I had, I had a few different things pulling me in different directions, which is what happens for a lot of from women. So in terms of what does that 
feel like for many people, I would say this. So that varies based on stage of life. There are people who they have a lot of caretaking responsibilities. It might, there might be financial obligations. There might be pressures related to their health, related to juggling a lot of different things. If they have a job, they have a career. There's that piece in certain communities. If let's say a woman has a husband who's learning a kolel, so then she has more pressure on her in terms of the job piece. Even just chesed, our community, we value that it's not just doing what you're doing for your family, but we have a certain culture of pitching in and, and it's beautiful. I mean, you mentioned before about Chaverim, my husband's on Hansala, right? So we really, as a community, we value being part of these different things. And so the pressures of that, it's not just, okay, I'm taking care of these things, but I always need to be, or, you know, people feeling a sense of, I should be doing more. I think the chesed piece, I think even just the making time for taking care of your kids, school, school things, talking to parents, you know, parent teacher conferences, friendships, right? Even I find a lot of, a lot of mothers find that they've lost some of that freedom to have time to be with their friends and that maybe they're making friends through their children. So meaning if they're at the school play, maybe they're sitting in the back hanging out with someone, but the idea of having a lot of time to go out with friends or be in touch with old friends. I find that that's a challenge for people as well. Even right. hobbies. We, we talk about um, yes. like carpool. We have friends with the carpool. Who are my friends with who I'm carpooling with that year? Those are my friends. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's very, it's, it's very, it's very situational. It's very situational. I find, and my friends and I discussed this, that it's sometimes easier to make friends before age 25 because some of those friends in those earlier years you were in the same place at the same time, you were in school, you were in camp, you lived together. So there's a depth to that kind of friendship. You amass these, you know, certain banter inside. Joke. I have friends, we still have 30 year old inside jokes that we're texting each other about because we saw something that reminded us of that. So even just that, I also think even time for spirituality, I find a lot of from women find that after they get married and they're busy in the grind and they have their kids, they they miss having certain moments where they were able to, let's say, dive in or go to shul or learn, and they're trying to squeeze that in. And that's not to say that men don't have that same challenge, but I find that for women, that's something that sense of spirituality is something that uh, many people miss. Before I keep rambling, is there anything mm. you wanted to? Because I know you guys aren't in New York, so you don't interrupt people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was born in New York City. <laughs> um, no, but. It's interesting. So I, I'm curious why you're mentioning the spirituality piece. Are you saying because that's lacking? That's and how is that impacting our sense of overwhelm? I think it can lack. A, I think it, I think that lacking can affect the sense of overwhelm because there are people who really find that that can. There are not everyone. There are people who don't feel that they get energized by that. But there are people who really feel that the spirituality piece helps them and gives them a sense of meaning of like, what is this all about? It's just, is life just a series of filling up lunch boxes, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's or between carpools, right? There's more to living in that way. So that's where I think the spirituality piece can, for some people, give them a sense of meaning and a sense of energy, take them out of their head a little bit. But again, this varies based on, on different people. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, I'm, I forgot to ask, I forgot to mention, even just cooking and Shabbos and Shabbos being a hard deadline, right? Every Friday we have a hard deadline and yeah, we have 18 minutes, but we have a hard <laughs> deadline, right? But after Every that, week, that's I'm like, it. <laughs> right, I'll, every week I'm like this week, it's not going to be a buzzer beater this week. I'm going to be those people that light candles 10 minutes before. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that sense of a hard deadline and, and cooking for Shabbos and cooking for holidays and prepping for holidays. Again, these don't, these things don't automatically make someone overwhelmed. That that's also the piece here. I don't think these things automatically make someone overwhelmed, but having all these different pressures may contribute to that. I feel like I probably forgot something important there on that list, but Mm-hmm. whatever I think, it I might think be covered. Yeah. A really nice variety of all of the things that do contribute to when, when we're in a certain headspace and we're being pulled in 15 different directions from all of the obligations. Like, what does that, what does that look like? I think that you covered a lot of the bases. And I would add to that, the, one of the challenges I find specifically for, from women is we also have a certain value of being selfless. If you go to any shul dinner or any school dinner or read any write-up that's describing someone's amazing characteristics, and they'll say, 
They're so selfless, right? The thing with selfless is that selfless can also lend itself to not having boundaries, right? Because if I don't have a self, then where do I start and end? And where do you start and end? And if there's this constant talk about being the and how, how would you, how would you translate that word? I don't want to mistranslate yeah. it. Like giving in, like, um, yeah, like letting someone else win, <laughs> letting someone else be right. I don't know. I'm trying, there's a lot of, it's, yeah. it's, it's a good question. It's a very delicate word because it's used in a virtuous way, right? I find right. a lot of women in their college classes are being taught that as a value. So right. that can also add to the sense of feeling overwhelmed because when you have, and again, this is not everyone, and I'm not talking that every single person struggles with this, but these are certain cultural pieces here. When there's a concept in your head that the ideal is to just be completely selfless, that can make someone feel more overwhelmed because then it's harder to say no to things. And they're constantly in this space of, I should be doing more. And I'm not allowed to say no or take time for myself. If Mm -hmm. I take time for myself, then I'm selfish. Right. And so I don't want to be selfless. I I don't want to be selfish. I I want to be selfless. And so selflessness, it can be generous, but it could also be degenerating. And when it's degenerating, that's going to make someone feel more overwhelmed. Right. Absolutely. It's it's sort of like self-negating, I would think, Mavater. And I think also like that, you know, that picture that you're painting, there are a lot of values, you know, or um, I think we struggle with this image of the super from woman, you know, who has a large family and all the things that make her super is the more balls that are in the air that she's juggling. So she's, Mm -hmm. you know, involved in the kids school, involved in the shawl, you know, keeping the house, having a large family, like working, like who, who created this? This is just like this phantom, you know, and, and who said that the busier we are means that the more fulfilled we are. That's just absolutely. Absolutely. My mother attended Barnard in the seventies and said that the line then was, you know, you can have it all. And, but over the years that has shifted to maybe you can have it all, but not all at the same time. Right. And I find that for many people, that is definitely a construct that they struggle with today is I not just, I can have it all. I need to look like I have it all and I need to be it all right. Right. I need, I, I need to be it all. It's not okay. If I'm just good enough or getting by, everything has to be, everything has to be something that everyone's wowed by. And (laughs) I think that that adds to the overwhelm that adds to the pressure. Yeah. A lot of pressure. Maybe as a society, we should be wowed by people who are able to know when to say no. Yeah. The boundary setting role models. Boundary setting is not easy for women. And this is not just a Jewish thing. Women in general, I find really struggle. I mean, I work in Manhattan. This is something that women struggle with in terms of if I say this doesn't work for me, right? This idea of a soft no, Mm -hmm. right? what is the soft? No, it means the person's going to try harder to push you. Or even when people say, Oh, you know, they wouldn't take no for an answer. So we see that as very ambitious, persevering, but won't take no for an answer can also be abusive. So I think a lot of these things, when we look at them with a little more nuance and also ask ourselves, how have we absorbed these values and how has that translated into our behaviors and what we're, what we're aspiring to be, is that helping us? Is it hurting us? It's constant reflecting and reassessing. Absolutely. I think that self-reflection piece is like really the most important part. And I think that maybe also something, and you can tell me, Rachel, if this is something that you've seen, if someone has started off from a place of like self-negation where there, there are no boundaries and they're just saying yes to everything and everything, then if they reach the realization that it's, you know, ha- harming them really, then they might swing to the opposite side where then they say no to everything. And then they don't also take that piece of where we, we are, we do have communal obligations and we should give when we can. And then it's like, then eventually they have to come back to the middle of knowing when to say yes and when to say no. Cause we shouldn't always say no, but we shouldn't always say yes. It should be that nuance <laughs> it's of like finding that battle of uh, finding that balance. Yeah. It's, it's finding, it's looking at that battle and finding that balance. I find that sometimes Adel Madel becomes angry Madel because <laughs> she's always saying yes, 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 yes. And then, then all of a sudden it's, well, what about me? Or what wow. about the fact that I keep saying yes to things and I end up getting hurt in a certain kind of way. I think part of boundaries over time for people is that you start to alert. It's like a muscle. I think when you're starting to work a muscle, it takes time for it to get stronger. And with time it starts, you'll be able to, you can lift more, more easily. So mm-hmm. when people start saying no and start laying boundaries, beginning, it feels very, very uncomfortable. And in some circles and some families, boundaries are betrayal, honestly. Mm-hmm. 
it can really feel like betrayal. Like, what do you mean? You've always been a yes person. You've always said, yes, this is, we are yes people. And we describe people, by the way, don't we wish we'll, we'll describe people as they're a yes person, right? And a no person is no, don't ask, no fly zone, right? So <laughs> even just this idea that normalizing and naming that it's not easy to set boundaries but not setting boundaries contributes to that feeling of being overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So this leads very nicely into the next topic we want to discuss with you, Rachel, which is burnout, which I know there's been a lot written about that lately. Um, and I'd love to hear your perspective on like the relationship with, between burnout and juggling our responsibilities as from women. Sure. So I first heard about burnout when I was becoming a social worker as mental health professionals, burnout is something that's often on our radar as a concern because we are in a space where we are engaging in work, where we're carrying other people's pain, we're sitting with them in their pain. And for people who aren't mindful of themselves, that could really lead to a sense of burnout, especially when there are things going on in the world that are very overwhelming. Right now we're looking at burnout for many healthcare workers, very mental health, very, very, uh, you know, for mental health professionals who have been very involved with trauma work, there's always a high rate or a high chance of burnout. So this is something that's always been on my radar. I think now people are learning about it on their own more, especially with what's going on. The three things that I would say can characterize burnout to sum it up at the risk of oversimplifying it is number one, a sense of like depletion and energy depletion and exhaustion, which I think that's more than just, oh, I'm so tired. I didn't sleep last night. Mm -hmm. It's this feeling of even if, even if you do get a good night's sleep or decent night's sleep, you're still waking up in the morning and feel like you got hit by a Mack truck. Oh, that's and, what I thought this morning, <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, and I don't know why people think it's normal to tell people, oh, you look so tired. I know, right? right? You know, I always say, you know, because there are times people have said that to me and I said, I actually got eight hours last night. So, <laughs> and that's why we're know. putting on our makeup furiously in the morning, covering up our bags. <laughs> I, I often joke that you don't need to tell someone they look tired. Most people know that they're tired. They don't need an outside person to let them know. I think you're tired. So, right. So there's that energy depletion and exhaustion that's beyond just physical. It's, it's this draining, like I got nothing left kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Number two is there's often an increased, a certain mental distance. In other words, people feeling a certain like maybe I'm showing up physically, but I, I'm not there. Or there's this glass wall in between me and everything going on in my life. And it's very painful for people because there are, there are ways where burnout can mean that someone is physically stuck, that they can't get out of bed. And this often can look like depression also, but there are times where burnout might have a very obvious physical presentation, but there are plenty of people where the burnout does not mean that they aren't showing up for things that you're not seeing them with a smile on their face, but there could be that it's like this glass wall of I'm here, but I'm here, but I can't really touch it. I can't, I can't really totally be in it. And that mental distance is there's a numbness often with that too, where people recognize I'm just not feeling things as much as I used to. It could be for better, for worse, meaning they're, they're not feeling They're not even necessarily feeling angry or sad. They're just feeling like a certain mental distance from things. And then the third thing, right? So we had energy depletion, mental distance. And the third one is a a higher negativity, a certain cynicism. When people are feeling burnt out, there can be a lot more of just this. And you see this on social media. You see the way people are fighting constantly and you kind of want to be like, what's this really about? Mm-hmm. You don't, you're the way you're talking to this stranger. Like, yeah. I don't think they're the one who are you really mad at right now? Oh, and I'm such sure. a therapist the way I'm talking, but it's like, <laughs> who are you really, are you really angry at Tim in Montana who you never <laughs> met? And he says something you don't agree with, right? No, there's just, there's a burnout that kind of is this undercurrent that it drives so much of this of a neg- uh, sense of negativity. So I would say those three things can often manifest with burnout and there's with burnout, there's often something chronic about it. Mm. It's not just, I had a rough day or a rough week or even a rough, rough month or chapter. It's like a rough decade, meaning not going to say you had a rough decade, right? You probably call it something else. So there's something often very 
something about it that doesn't feel like it's letting up and that quick resets don't feel like enough. So going away for a weekend or getting a, you know, good night's sleep, if you, like that certain things being resolved mean, and, and it's still there, mm-hmm. it's still there. So it's like more like a systemic problem in a, in a sense, there's something about the, the way that life is structured or some, some things that need like a, a greater overhaul than just a weekend away to like sit and for like sure. It's to- and with burnout, you're also looking at something that there's a shift from a certain baseline. And that's why it's so personal to each person. There, there are some people that their burnout and their level of functioning at burnout is what other people wish they could be doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which can be very lonely for them because if they were to say to people, yeah, I'm, I'm just not myself, which by the way, that, that I'm just not myself thing, you know, very common. Mm-hmm. The, I'm just not myself or I haven't been able to, to do X and Y anymore. And the person's response is like, really? I wish I could be doing X and Y. So it has to do with a certain baseline place where you used to be. And now you're, you're just, you're feeling like that place you used to be is so far in the distance that you could see it now mm-hmm. that it's, and it's a, I would describe it best as it's grieving vibrancy. Hmm. It's a yeah. sense of vibrancy that's lost. Most people, when you really peel it down and you talk to them of like, what do you really want in life? What do you, or what are the, what are the experiences that they miss or the people they miss it? It's often, there's a sense of that they felt vibrant, that they felt alive, that they felt connected. And with burnout, there's, there's something, there could be something in the way of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you could be, um, you could experience burnout, but not necessarily be clinically depressed. Like it sounds like there must be some kind of fine line between those two. Right. And there's without oversimplifying it, because I'm very careful when we're talking about mental health diagnosis that, right. yeah, they're absolutely just because somebody is feeling burnt out. doesn't mean that they quote unquote, you know, they meet the criteria for depression. But I do think that it's so personal that there are people who, yeah, they may not check the boxes of major depressive disorder, but when I say to that person, what's your sense of where you're at right now? You know, you look at the last five years of your life, or you look at the last year and they're, they lost themselves. Hmm. They lost a part of themselves or they, they are so they're different from a certain baseline. Now the goal isn't necessarily that they're going to get back to that baseline. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that sometimes, by the way, can add to the overwhelming sense of pressure. Even just right before we got on, I saw an email I got about a Jewish workshop for women on relationships because all the relationship workshops are targeted towards women. And Mm -hmm. The way yeah, we got to do something about that, Rachel. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I, I think that's probably for another episode. Of why do we have that? Why is that so lopsided, right? Like why marriage, is so work on your marriage. Uh-huh. Ladies You're are trying the, way, the, the women are running. And then yeah. if they want to do a male event, they have to also have like rolling cigars and wandering yeah, queue exactly. at yeah, exactly. the event so that nobody thinks you might be going for the lecture. Right, right exactly. Steaks. <laughs> Oh it's, I'm gonna keep yeah, my mouth shut. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll save it for another episode. We're gonna save it. Save all our thoughts. Saving. It. We're all. We're all. We're all. We're all being very good right now, right? Okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. Gold star. Gold stars for all of us. The um. Right, but in terms of that question you had asked, right? You you had asked about the. Oh, I was saying about women with the, the email that was saying, oh, no. "Come to this yeah. workshop," and it, and the. The, the line in the workshop was, you know, get that spark back that you had under your chuppah. Mm. We're going to help. I'm going to help you reignite that spark and that passion. And I read it and I was thinking, oh, this is so Hollywood, by the way, you're playing, yes. you are, you are actually playing off of people's fantasies. Oh, totally. No. No, right. no. That's number one. Number two, you're operating on the premise that everyone had that under their chuppah which not everyone did or does. And, and that can make people feel very lonely if that was how they started. Sometimes if they're hearing people talk about the goal is to reignite and they're thinking, but what are we reigniting if it wasn't there before? And time, time keeps moving. This idea that for any goal to be that you're going to get your old self back and that you're going to, that I find that goal is almost a non-starter because things change, relationships change. I'm much more the type to say, it's not about let's reignite. Let's try to make you feel like you're back under your hoopa, but where are we at right now? Right. Let's kind of be where we're at right now and get more of an understanding, more of a language of what's happened 
to us as people, as a couple, as a family, whatever it might be. So I think this idea of burnout, a lot of it to me is about what, what is your sense of how you find passion in what you do? And even are you aware when you are having those ups and downs, because sometimes burnout for some people is the first memo mm-hmm. that shut down for them because it really can feel like a shutdown. Sometimes that's the first time people will say, Oh, maybe I should go see a therapist. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think having more of a self-awareness in our day to day, in our week to week to say, I'm struggling with something, or I feel a little off right now and to address it earlier on, or to be able to scale back, right? I've spoken to other therapists during the pandemic in terms of how many clients they were seeing at a time. And we all had different numbers of what our max would be because for some people going over that line, they would burn out for other people, not as much. So a lot of it is about a self-awareness and respecting our own intuition about that, that what our, what our threshold for what we can handle may not be what somebody else's you know, in terms of what they're able to handle for burnout, to prevent burnout. Beautiful. Really beautiful. I feel like that already was like a a really nice tip. And I think just the general emphasis on just being self-aware, I think is really, I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of Mm self-awareness. Every time it comes up, I'm like, I love this topic. Um, And I think self-awareness needs to be balanced with, you know, like people love to say like, no one knows you like, you know, yourself. And I don't totally agree with that because Mm. we can't be objective about our own behaviors. We can't, be objective, right? We all have blind spots. You know, think about it when you're in a dressing room at a store and you'll ask someone, oh, how does it look in the back over here, right? Even when there's like 10 mirrors, there's a certain perspective on ourselves or of ourselves that we are not able to have no matter how intuitive, no matter how self-aware we are. So I think there's this balance of, we need to learn from others and also listen to ourselves and our own intuition and be open to the feedback for the blind spots that we just can't see. That's sometimes it's other people. Yeah. Sometimes other people will notice the burnout, right? Sometimes other people <laughs> might say that person, they're not just saying, oh, you look tired. Right. That's something the person is right. something might, you know, sometimes right. that is the memo that people will hear is right, you exactly. don't seem like yourself. Is everything okay? Right. Cause they're just so head down focused, get through the day, get through the day, get through the moment, get through the minute, you know, that sometimes it does take that outside that outside um, stimulus, that outside. And I would also add, right. And then you're talking about move, the moving fast thing, right. Of just no, nonstop. The, like that, that, that or someone just else the... would be the first, that, that someone else would be the first one to notice because you yourself, not you, but a person may not notice themselves because they are so focused on just getting through the day that they may not even notice how burnt out that they are. So then it mm-hmm. would be a friend or a loved one. Right. Maybe. right. Yeah. So let's, so let's talk some solutions. You've already given us so many great tips. What are some further tips that you can share with all of us and all of our listeners and our watchers, like about how to manage this burnout, this overwhelm? So a couple of things there. I find we love to get tips. We want to hear hacks. We want the shortcuts, (laughs) right? Just tell me what to do. It's true. This is a podcast, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Meaning what? This is a hack? We're we're here to provide tips and advice. And this, yeah, I mean, while I do consider sometimes these interviews like therapy sessions, because wow, I benefit so much. I'm, you know, speaking to therapists for free, but we do have to, it's, it's the nature of the, of podcasting is we have to sort of whittle things down. And unfortunately we can't do as much of a deep dive as we would want to. Right. For sure. And I'm not, that wasn't a, and I, I'm sorry if I sounded like that was a critique against the oh, podcast no. injury. Not at all. It's a <laughs> no, no, no. But it's uh, it's more about that we want tips. We want a recipe. Just give me the recipe, and I go home yeah. and I cook it up, and it's perfect. Mm. And I think it's helpful to also address to recognize. Okay, I'm looking at what's happening on the ground in terms of behaviors, but also what are my thoughts and beliefs behind that, right? And CBT, but this CBT didn't make it up. You see it in the Torah. Mm. This idea of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, the cognitive triangle and how they all connect with each other. And so when we're looking at our lives and our day-to-day, especially when we're talking about feeling overwhelmed with responsibilities, I find it very helpful to kind of take a step back and first say to ourselves, where did I get my ideas about what my adulthood is supposed to look like in terms of my productivity? Where, Where did I get those ideas? What did I see in my own house growing up? There are some people that their goal as a mother is to recreate what they had, or sometimes it's their goal to recreate the opposite of what they had. So it's 
that adds a lot of pressure to things. In other words, that if people grew up seeing a certain standard and then they're trying to recreate that, that can set certain pressures. I'll, I'll, I'm going to give an example. One of the best pieces of advice I got when I got married, my mother-in-law said to me, Rachel, it's okay if people can't take a third piece of chicken if they come to you for Shabbos, for Shabbos lunch. In other words, that, that sense of, oh, we have to make so much food. And that, you know, people who say, if there's no leftovers, it means there wasn't enough food. Mm. That, that idea of having to perform, not just mm-hmm. be present, but having to perform can set certain standards. I grew up in a house where there were always like people coming and going and family stopping by. It was like Grand Central Station. It was like, you know, as a teenager, the word we'd use, it was so random. It was so random. All these random people, you know, so this, this cousin, you know, this, the, you know, this cousin was driving by and that friend was, you know, oh, and then I grew up in the five towns. So we were near JFK. So, oh, and then we're going to go pick up cousin so-and-so who just flew in from Israel and drive them to teen. Like there was just this sense of energy, which was amazing. And I loved it. And our Shabbos meals, we often had guests and my mom was not, and is not someone who ever gave me this message that we need to do things to prove things to other people and that we need to tablescape because we have to impress people in a certain way. And the table was always beautiful and food was good. So I find that for me now as a mother and as a wife and part of a community and hosting and things like that, that I don't feel a tremendous pressure that I need everyone to walk into my home and look at the table and be like, oh my gosh. But there are people who do. And there are people who got that message growing up. And I think that that can contribute to how overwhelmed you feel. Because if you get the message that every person needs to walk out of your home saying this was the best meal they ever ate, right. that's going to make someone feel more overwhelmed. So asking ourselves, what are the messages and ideas that I picked up about how I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to behave? We mentioned earlier about feeling, you know, being selfless and always being quick to say, you know, being a yes person. I think that is something that people need to look at for themselves. In other words, are you taking on things that you could say no to, right? When it comes to self-care, I look at self-care as yes, there's behaviors, but is something coming from a place of nurture or a place of torture? You could be doing the same behavior from a place of nurture or a place of torture. So in other words, you could, I, I I'm a runner. So You could be running three miles because you genuinely love the idea of connecting with your body or just the idea of exercise, taking care of yourself or, and that's a place of nurture. You could also be running three miles because you had a cookie this morning. That I think is not necessarily a place of nurture. That's more of a place of, I need to balance that out. So I therefore need to go do this. And obviously that's for a different discussion of food and things like that. But this idea of my doing this from a place of nurture or torture, right? So am I making my sukkah look like a palace because I genuinely enjoy that process? And if you're creative, right? I genuinely enjoy that. And it, it, feel, it helps me connect with the holiday. Or am I doing it from a place of torture in the sense that I feel this pressure that it's not okay if people just come to my sukkah and there's a few pictures of gadolim on the wall or there's nothing on the wall right. or, you know, so I think the nurture torture piece from a practical Rachel, perspective. It's, it's, I'm yeah. so happy you mentioned this because I do think about, like you mentioned tablescapes and I have friends who just love doing it. They're creative. Okay. Rifki. <laughs> and it is not a coming from a place of torture for them. It doesn't cause overwhelm. It's like mm-hmm. an expression. It's an outlet. And I think that's so important is we need to identify, like if, if it's going to be, you know, an unhealthy experience for us, or if it's going to be something that's really nurturing for us. And that goes for signing up for things, yeah. agreeing to take on things. Am I, am I being a yes person? Am I saying yes to this communal event? Because I really, it's something I believe in and I feel strongly about it and I want to make space for it. Or is it a place of torture of, I need to be the person who always says yes. So that when people talk about me, they say, oh, she's such a big Mm yes. She's on like every single committee. Right. So and I'm sure not everyone talks that way, but you know what I mean? That sense of, <laughs> and if you do talk that way, it's all good. But that sense of why am I saying yes? I, even just from a philosophical perspective, looking at things 
what are, are there tight ends in your life that need to be loosened? And are there loose ends that need to be tightened? When I, like when we're talking about self-care. Mm-hmm. So an example of, are there loose ends that need to be tightened? That could be an example of my door is always open and everyone knows that even on Friday, two hours before Shabbos, they can call me and say, we're coming for lunch tomorrow. So that is a loose end that doesn't, it's not bad, but that could be something where we might have to tighten that and say, maybe Friday, two hours before Shabbos is, is pushing it. Maybe Thursday night should be the deadline. Or you know what? Maybe you want to rethink the whole thing and say, it just is too much pressure, the financial burden, whatever it might be. So that would be an example of a loose end that you might tighten, right? The example of a tight end that you might loosen is something like, I always need to serve an appetizer Mm. or I always need, right. A certain, a certain rigidity about something that doesn't necessarily need to have that rigidity. Now, if someone enjoys making those appetizers, and again, it's coming from that place of this is something they enjoy. That's one thing. In fact, I've seen in Mishpacha or Ami recently, there have been letters to the editor where people complain when they see certain recipes or certain Shabbos meals yeah, and the whole list, <laughs> there's all, and, and it's, it's very interesting to me to see the responses. There are some people who will say, you're making us look bad. Right. <laughs> right? And then there's some people who say, take what you want and leave the rest. Okay. Exactly. So that might, you know, I, I like to make that distinction of, is this inspiration or intimidation? Right. Am I looking at this and saying, this gives me right. good ideas? Or am I looking at this and say, I'm a failure because I'm not making my own baba binosh. You know what I mean? So (laughs) where does, I I think people, and being mindful, you're talking about like practical tips, people being mindful. What are you reading? What are you watching? What is contributing to your sense of what normal quote unquote is? And what is your barometer for success and for feeling like you're good enough? Mm -hmm. Well, look what you just said. What are we consuming? So let's talk about consuming on social media, because I know that you're very involved, um, right. Like, and, and building community and guiding women, especially, especially, you know, in your role, um, tell us your role at the layers project just reminds me clinical. So I'm the clinical director. So clinical when director. the layers project yeah. turned into a magazine four years ago, so Shira Lincoln Sheps, who's also a social worker said, okay, we're going to be talking about mental health topics. We should have a therapist around. So right. that's right. how I was brought on. And my work there is to really be looking at, are we putting out content that is sensitive for people to read and sensitive for people to share? Because Mm -hmm. there's always this sweet spot of, we want to talk about real things that are going on for people, but how do we deliver that to them? And also recognizing they need to be able to, I I look at it like this, someone needs to be able to read something and then put their phone down and then do an errand. They, they're Mm -hmm. often what, meaning when you're reading something loaded and whether it has a trigger warning or not. So people, because of smartphones, you're often reading things when you're on the go and you're, you're not necessarily sitting with your cup of tea at your table. And then afterwards saying, what does this feel like for me? Right. Most people are not (laughs) doing that. That is why social media is inherently triggering. It's because of the on the go nature of it. And like, we're not prepared for a lot of the stuff that we consume. So what I, what I'm curious about is on social media, you know, many women clearly find community and many mm-hmm. women feel that it's a place that they can share their struggles and, and, you know, find validation for them. So how has social media and this whole, you know, new climate impacted women's attitudes towards struggles? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I do think community is, it's interesting. I read a study that came out years ago, must've been like 15 years ago. And it said that in times of crisis, women tend to do what's it's they said tend and befriend that when women are in a place of struggle and crisis they're more likely <clears throat> excuse me to turn to other people and find their people mm. but in the study they said men are a lot less likely to do that and there's more isolation in that way which i think this is just one of my theories why there were some people when covid first started and it was really bad why there was such a defiance with Minyanim in the morning. Mm-hmm. Cause I think that there were men 
who that was the only place where there was any kind of social uh-huh. outlet to connect with other people because yeah. mm-hmm. otherwise there was, there was nothing left, but that's obviously a different discussion, but in terms of, in terms of where social media plays a role here. So besides the fact that it's very distracting, in other words, that when you have something that's always taking your mind off of what's in front of you, mm-hmm. whatever's in front of you then needs to be a lot more exciting to be interesting. <laughs> Because if there's always something in your hand that seems to be more interesting and you're getting the thrill from what's in your hand, so then whatever's in front of you may not bring you that same happiness or joy. Mm -hmm. And from a serotonin, dopamine, neurotransmitter perspective, this is very significant in terms of how our technology affects our ability to actually enjoy things. Because that's the thing, Mm -hmm. when people feel overwhelmed, but they're also feeling joy and they're also feeling payoff. That's a different discussion. That's interesting. But when you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling burnout and you're not feeling any fruits of your labor, that's where we also really, we want to get curious. What's, what's going on there that we're not able to have the moments with let's say feeling overwhelmed, but also feeling payoff moments to some of that, to some of that work. So in terms of social media, One of the issues is that you have a sense of community. You can find your people. If you've been through certain traumas or challenges, you can find those little niche communities, little Instagram communities. You find your people, which is amazing, right? But there's also a lot of comparison on social media. There's a lot of jealousy. It is so easy. You look at other people's lives and no matter how much you know intellectually, Mm -hmm. there's a part of your brain that is separate from that intellectual part. And you're seeing what other people have, what other people are doing and all that has to take is a few seconds of seeing that tablescaping, let's say, or that how, you know, their shelf monos, how that looks, or, or, or even just how the person looks, mm-hmm. right? Right. right? Mm-hmm. How they put themselves together, right? Most right. people don't look like they walked out of a magazine shoot. Most people don't. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. even and just that's that what piece, these posts really are, are magazine shoots with people who are doing their makeup and, you know, they're right. curating it's their liter- outfits. It's, the it's literally, it's literally angle. shot my look, literally shot my yeah. look. Yeah here it's literally shot my look so it's that and again i don't want to sound like i'm throwing everyone under the bus on social media i have seen incredible things happen because of social media in terms of the grassroots aspect the the empowerment that people feel in terms of challenging shame stigmas opening up conversations is amazing but the sense of jealousy or the sense of insecurity right it's so overwhelming for people when they feel like i have to do X and Y in order to be at just the regular level of what other people seem like they're doing, even if those people are not doing that, right? There are many fashion bloggers who will show that they'll take all those pictures on the same day. So it's not that they look like that every single morning. Mm, right. It's, and, and, and I'll be honest, even the people who do post what their outfit is every single morning, I have my own feelings about that in terms of what's happening here of our sense of modesty. And, and I do sex therapy. I'm not someone who's saying, oh, we're not allowed to be out. and put-. No, no. But it's that what's happening on social media is that it's become normal for people to be posting videos of themselves in their bedrooms, mm. <laughs> with, which to me is so fascinating from its newest perspective, how mm. that became normal. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is another episode. <laughs> but that's a whole other episode. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, a whole other yeah. episode. But my point is, is that social media shifts norms. Right. It yeah, shifts definitely. norms in a way that sometimes if you're only talking to other people who, if you're only talking to other people who are on social media, then you are only talking to people who may buy into that norm. And yeah, sometimes exactly. when you explain certain things to people outside, they're like, right. what? Totally had that experience. Well, yeah. So in turn, the echo chamber. Yeah, you were I, I asked, I, no, no, I was just thinking like, I, I, you know, when, when people are going through a specific thing where they need to find a community online, cause maybe they don't have anyone in their actual mm-hmm. physical location, but what happened that, that, that for sure serves a very specific purpose. You know, when you need the validation, you need advice, you need to know, you know, things that can maybe have helped other people. But what happens if a person finds themselves where they, their community is only online and they don't have any actual, you know, has, could that then also create a false sense of community, but we still need actual community where we live too. Mm. Have you found like so that is also something it that- It depends. I think it varies. I don't talk about specific clients. I talk about patterns, not people. So I would just say that people are different in terms of being more introverted, being more extroverted. 
There are people who really like being in person. There are people who like being in person in groups. Mm -hmm. There are people who like being in person, but more one-on-one. I think the pandemic has actually shifted this a little bit. Like I've noticed myself, I'm an extrovert. And when I'm, but when I'm in big groups now, I feel more overwhelmed. And I never used to feel that way before the pandemic. Yeah. Like when I've gone to weddings, it was just, um, there's so many people here. And sensory overload. I, <laughs> and I'm, I had 650 people on my wedding. I mean, I'm used to wow. big parties. So, but I've noticed two years in a pandemic that that has definitely shifted for me and maybe it will go back, but I don't know. And, and that's okay if it doesn't, but the sense of expectations that people pick up through social media can certainly contribute to their sense of feeling overwhelmed Mm -hmm. because if they feel a pressure and that pressure may not be rational, that's the thing. Also, people can know intellectually, they can know rationally. I know this is silly. I know this is not that important in the scheme of things. Yet there's also a part of me that is just saying, I got to do this and I have to make this work. And I think for me as a therapist, I find it very helpful when therapy can be that space for all those different parts of someone where it's not just about toxic positivity of saying, we're just going to dismiss the things that you're feeling in this way. And we just need to, you know, tie everything neatly with a bow and just say, everything happens for a reason where yes, everything happens for a reason, but that may not be the emotional space somebody's in. Going back to the question of how social media and the contribution to people's perception or pressures in their struggles. I think part of it also is people feeling like they can find language for what they're going through. It's very difficult when, when you're going through something and you have all these different feelings and you can't articulate them. You don't have words for them. And that could be for different reasons. And one of the things that social media has done is it's given an opportunity for people to give language to what they're going through and for other people to be like, yeah, 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 that's it, that's it. Right. Mm-hmm. There's also a difference I find between, like there's different components to it. There's a sense of, I have a voice inside me and I could, I could sense it. So there's that, but whereas other people may not, other people may not know what they feel about something. Then you can say, okay, I, I know what I feel about something, but I have this skepticism about the fact that I feel that way, or I don't think I'm allowed to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And then you can have also a situation where you know how you feel about something, you recognize that it's okay to feel that way, but you don't have sound for that voice. In other words, there's that voice inside, but it doesn't have sound. In other words, you can't formulate, you can't, you can't get it out. When people learn language for their challenges, they're able to get it out more and talk to other people and find support. And not just in therapy. I would say, there are things that people come to therapy for that we it, we could have more of in our society and that would make things much easier for people. If people felt more safe and validated and if we had HIPAA privacy laws in friendship, right? You know, I think I think therapy the is privacy, the kind of thing where- Privacy laws in friendship, I love that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Right? I think, I think high, these right? are- like the, the, like right, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, if, we, if people were able to feel these things outside of therapy, they wouldn't necessarily have to run to therapy. And- social media for some, and it's not even just for some, I think in, you can have sitting, looking at your phone, you can be looking at things that are making you feel better about yourself or more like you're like other people. And you can also be sitting there and walk away feeling worse. And there are studies, there is data that backs that up in terms of how do people feel after they are consuming social media. Mm-hmm. Obviously there's variables because are they feeling depressed because they looked at social media or were they looking at social media because they were feeling depressed anyway? Exactly. Chicken or the egg. Exactly. There's yeah, definitely chicken cool. or the egg. Yeah. Rachel, this however, has been- it definitely reinforces things. It yeah, definitely, Rachel. um, I was just going to say something. Yeah. We, if you just want to wrap, wrap up because we yeah. are, this, okay. this yeah, it's been yeah. amazing. <laughs> so, so going back, so in terms of how this all kind of comes together. Cause I feel like we were like talking about all these different components here. And, and it is, it is a big topic because it, it applies to, to people in so many different ways. And it's so personal to each person. Mm-hmm. And that's why what, what might be helpful for one person may be really not helpful for another person and looking at our behaviors and looking at what's behind our behaviors. And also what does it mean when we feel overwhelmed? Even just learning, what does it mean for us to sit with our feelings? Are we able to be mindful? Are we 
able to meditate. And there are people that meditation is not for them and that's okay. But even just a curiosity about ourselves and are we making time to slow down? Because very often when you're feeling overwhelmed and you have a lot going on in your life, you compartmentalize things that are happening. But if you never have a chance to address all the feelings that you're compartmentalizing, mm -hmm. you will then pro you will probably get to a point where there's a, an uncomfortable memo <laughs> letting you know whether, whether it's through burnout or it's through other things. Yeah. A lot of this is about finding balance and people having realistic expectations and being willing to look at where am I getting my expectations from about how I take care of myself, my recognition that I, that I deserve that, that I'm allowed to take care of myself. And I'm also allowed to challenge some of the attitudes I might've absorbed about taking care of myself. Beautiful. Mm. Rachel, wow. I just, I feel really honored to have you on the podcast. I'm sure if you would agree yes, and accurate. thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom, your insights, um, and you. practical tips. You know, I think that there's a lot here that you've been able to share with us and really grateful for having you on deep, deep, meaningful. Thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. Thank you. Now it's time for today's takeaway. First things first, how do you know when you're overwhelmed? What does it feel like? What steps do you take to manage your overwhelm? We all have a lot of responsibilities, whether we're working full-time or we're not. Are there any things that we can cut out of our lives that can make juggling the juggling act a little simpler? And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of DMC. We always love listener feedback, and there are a few ways you can provide it. First, you can rate and review our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. It's super helpful, so please and thank you. And you can also leave a comment on our YouTube video for this episode. Yep. As always, you can email us at dmc at meaningfulminute.org. And speaking of Meaningful Minute, of course, we want to thank them and the entire Meaningful Minute team, giving them a huge shout out for all the work that they do to making DMC happen. See you next episode. <laughs>